Today on Basic Bytes, a 3 for 1 programming tutorial. I'm going to write a short basic program which is going to demonstrate how to detect the number of rows and columns on the current text screen and how to interact with kernel routines and CPU registers and how to detect whether or not we are running on the Commodore 128. Speaking of good things coming in threes, this program is not only going to work on the Commodore 64 and the 128, but on the VIC-20 as well. <laughs> Greetings, it's JC at Basic Bytes. Today's programming tutorial comes from one piece of a larger project that I am currently working on in BASIC. I need my program to be able to detect how many rows and columns there are on the current text screen so that I can lay out a bunch of Petsky accordingly. Now, given the Commodore 64, you might very well ask why I don't just hardcode these numbers to 40 columns and 25 rows. Well, I decided to make things a bit more challenging in that I would like my program to be able to work on the Commodore 128 as well. Which, of course, means we also need a means of detecting whether or not we are running on the 128. On the Commodore 64 side of things, even though I don't do any coding specifically for the VIC-20, it turns out that the Commodore 64's memory map is so similar to that of the VIC-20 in this regard that if we do not assume what the size of the screen is, this same code will work on the VIC-20 as well. Therefore, adding that machine to our compatibility list is just a bonus. Before we jump into the code, let us take a moment to consider exactly how we're going to detect the size of the current screen. One of the nice things about the Commodore 8-bit computers is that they provide a set of standardized kernel functions which, at least in theory, are supposed to provide cross-compatibility between the various machines. For detecting the current screen format, Commodore has us covered with a function called screen, which is documented on page 295 of your Commodore 64 programmer's reference guide. As we see here, the call address is 65517, so it should be just as simple as doing a syscall to 65517, right? Well, not exactly. Notice in the description that this routine returns the format of the screen, for example, 40 columns by 25 lines, in X and Y. Now, if you've ever had the misfortune of writing anything in assembly, you already know what X and Y are. As a brief explanation, though, the 6502 microprocessor has what the basic programmer can essentially regard as three bytes of RAM within the processor itself. Each of these one-byte locations is referred to as a register, and these are the accumulator, the x-index register, and the y-index register, which, for brevity, we simply call the a, x, and y registers, respectively. Various kernel routines expect you to put certain values into these registers before calling the routine in order to instruct the routine as to what exactly you want it to do. On the flip side, kernel functions may also put values into the A, X, and Y register, which indicate the results of their work for the programmer to then subsequently read out. That is precisely the sort of routine that we're dealing with here. The obvious question in front of us is, how do we access the processor's registers from BASIC? With all of that in mind, let's start going through the code. This is a fairly small and, I hope, straightforward program that, when run, simply outputs the number of rows and columns detected on the active screen. Active being the key word because, of course, when you're dealing with the Commodore 128, you have both 40-column and 80-column screens available. Speaking of that, I will demonstrate this program's interoperability by showing what it looks like on the Commodore 128 and the VIC-20 towards the end of this video. Looking at the directory, 
you'll notice that the program is only three blocks in size. You'll also notice the somewhat fancy directory. That's because if you would like to play around with any of this code after the video, I have made this available as a D64 on my file share as Basic Bytes 221120. All told, there isn't much more than one screenful of code in this program. Nevertheless, we will step through it in bite-sized chunks. After a few initial titling remarks, we are first going to set up the variables that we need, and the first order of business there is detecting whether or not we are running on a Commodore 128. I begin by initializing a machine type variable to zero, which simply means default machine type. Now, you may indeed point out that initializing variables to zero is not required in BASIC, but especially since this program is meant to have an educational element to it, I am writing with verbosity in the hopes of producing maximum readability. It is also worth remembering that declaring and defining things as explicitly as possible is never a bad thing for the next guy who has to try and read your code. On line 40, we detect whether or not we are running on a Commodore 128 by peaking memory locations 65532 and 65533. In a 64K bank of memory, these two bytes are the second last pair of bytes. They are part of the kernel ROM and they hold the address of the reset routine for that computer. To our benefit, the reset vectors on the Commodore 64, the Commodore 128, and the VIC-20 are all different yet predictable. So, if memory location 65532 is 61, and memory location 65533 is 255, we then know that we are running on a Commodore 128, and we set our machine type to 128. With that variable set, any time in the remainder of our program that we need to do something different for the 128, we're simply going to check if machine type is 128 and act accordingly. Continuing onwards with our setup, we are going to create variables for the A, X, and Y processor registers that we've already talked about. You are probably aware that the basic sys command calls a machine language routine at whatever memory address you specify. However, the sys command does more than this. When sys is invoked, before calling the machine language routine, it takes whatever values are in memory locations 780, 781, and 782, and puts those values into the A, X, and Y processor registers, respectively. It then calls the machine language routine, but after the machine language routine completes, before it returns control to BASIC to continue executing the program, it takes whatever is in those processor registers and puts those values back into those memory locations. Therefore, by poking values into the three memory addresses that you see on line 70, we can set up the processor registers with whatever values we need in order to call a kernel routine. Similarly, if a kernel routine returns information, as is the case here, we simply need to peek these locations after the syscall in order to get the data back. And for those of you wondering why I included the A register when we already established that the screen routine only returns information in the X and Y registers, that will be explained in a bit. Moving on to line 80, if our machine type is equal to 128, then we need to set the A register, X register, and Y register to memory locations 6, 7, and 8. Going on a bit of a tangent, I personally question why these memory locations changed on the Commodore 128. Being a new computer, of course one could expect that it would have many differences in its memory map. However, 
the entire purpose of the kernel routines was to enable a baseline of programming interoperability between Commodore's various 8-bit computers. It seems to me that if you're going to change the memory locations that the programmer needs to use to interact with those routines, then you are working directly opposite that purpose. I therefore question whatever design decision led to this hack being necessary, although it is relatively easy to implement, as you see here. There is also a fourth, very different processor register called the status register, which is exposed on both the Commodore 64 and 128, and is required for some kernel routines, but it isn't necessary here, and therefore I haven't included it. And now, with our variables set up, we proceed to the main code, which is everything that you see here. The first thing we do is the syscall to our kernel screen routine at 65517. As previously mentioned, if you are calling a kernel routine that needs you to set up the CPU registers in advance, we would first need to poke the corresponding memory locations before doing the syscall. In this case, however, the screen routine requires no such parameters, so we simply call it. We then simply peek the value of the X register to get screen columns, and peek the value of the Y register to get screen rows. After that, we need to implement what I will call another hack for the Commodore 128. If machine type is 128, then we take whatever value we got for screen columns and add 1. Similarly, we take screen rows, and we also add 1. The reason we do this is because on the Commodore 128, the kernel screen function has actually been replaced with another function called jscr.org. And unlike the screen function, jscr.org is zero-based, not one-based. Therefore, while on a 40-column screen, screen would return 40, jscr.org would return 39, because it's numbering the columns 0 through 39, thus forcing us to add the extra 1 in order to get an equivalent result. Because, I mean, when you think about it, nothing says interoperability like replacing a standard library function that is supposed to return information in a standard way, and replacing it with a similar but different function which returns the same information in a similar but different way. <sighs> Holy mackerel. Okay, anyhow, moving on from that. We then create a third variable, which is SM, which stands for Screen Maximum Columns, and we set it to be the exact same value as Screen Columns. Now, you may very well wonder what the difference is between Screen Columns and Screen Max Columns, and indeed, on the Commodore 64 and VIC-20, there is no difference, and that's why we, as a default, make those two variables equal to one another. However, this is where additional functionality of the Commodore 128 comes into play. If machine type is 128, then we set the screen max columns variable to the value that was returned in the A register plus 1, because we're still working with 0-based rather than 1-based. This value that only the 128 returns in the A register is very useful depending upon what you're trying to find out about the present screen. On the Commodore 128, Basic Version 7 allows you to create an active window that is smaller than your current screen. So, for example, you could be working in a 20 by 20 window on the 40 column screen or on the 80 column screen, and in either case, X and Y would return 20 by 20. On the other hand, the screen max columns in the accumulator or A register 
always returns the maximum columns of the screen the user is on, regardless of what the active window size is. So for the 40 column screen, it will always return 39, and for the 80 column screen, it will always return 79. To add some clarity, I will show you this program working in a window on a 128 later in this video. Moving on, we've now collected all of our information so we can simply print out the active screen columns and rows per the values that are now contained within our variables. If the screen maximum columns does not equal screen columns, then we additionally print out the number of maximum columns on the screen, and then we end. To demonstrate the program on the other two machines, Vice Emulator is coming to the rescue. I have no means by which to capture the 80 column output on my Commodore 128, and I do not own a VIC-20 whatsoever. In this mode, the program is, in fact, just one screenful of code, and when we run it, it produces the expected result. But wait, there's more! On the Commodore 128's 40 column screen, the program looks much like it did on the Commodore 64. However, we have not yet seen the maximum columns come into play. Using the extended functionality of basic version 7, I'm going to define an active window starting from x and y coordinates 1 and 1, going to 30 and 20. If I now clear the screen, change the text color, and list the program, you'll notice that we are working in a window within the current screen. If I run the program now, it correctly reports that the active screen is 30 columns by 20 rows, and also reports that maximum columns is 40, thus we know which of the two screens of the Commodore 128 we are currently working on. To conclude, we move over to the VIC-20 and its relatively enormous font, and if we run our program here, you can see that with no machine-specific hacks whatsoever, the kernel routine has correctly reported that we are working on an active screen of 22 columns and 23 rows. If you found this interesting or entertaining, please, like and subscribe to Basic Bytes for more. And if you would like to play around with the code from today's video, head on over to my file share at files.basicbytes.ca where you can download this program in both D64 and P00 formats as Basic Bytes 221120. Thank you for watching.